example, a good example of uh, free enterprise, the market system, free market system, and uh, people uh, appreciate it. These people come all the way from upstate, 300 miles, South Carolina, all these various places. Naturally, it's cheaper and it's fresher than you pick in a supermarket. I don't like when inside and they summer time they make cold and winter time they make so hot. It is beautiful. You have a little walk and you have a little fresh air. Don't sit in your car all the time. You know, people you sit in the car, get out, get to the shop, sit in the car. This way you have a little walk. Have a fresh air, especially when it's sunshine. You can all even have some time, right? I recommend. I absolutely recommend this place to everybody. You should come. It's cute. <laughs> <laughs> this is buying it directly from the people who grow it and makes a very good feeling, you see, between when you're going to eat it, you know exactly who grew it for you. <laughs> The Green Market was organized in 1976 as an experimental project designed to revive the city farmer's market as a source of mutual benefit for both regional farmers and city residents. For the small-scale metropolitan area farmer who can sell his produce at retail instead of wholesale prices, Green Market can mean survival in the face of mounting costs of operation, urban sprawl, and competition from large-scale industrialized agriculture. For the city resident who has become increasingly dependent upon far-off sources of produce throughout the year, access to locally grown fruits and vegetables during the growing season can mean fresher, better tasting, and more nutritious food at lower than usual prices. By restoring direct contact between the city dweller and regional farmer, Green Market is hoping to contribute to the conservation of prime farmland at the urban fringe and the maintenance of a degree of regional self-sufficiency in food production. Beyond this, the market is intended to provide an opportunity for both farmer and city resident to meet one another and gain a deeper understanding of their interdependence. In its first year of operation, Green Market attracted more than 40 farmers from upstate New York, Long Island, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere to its three weekly locations in the city. Thousands of people from all parts of the city patronized the markets each day, providing the farmers with between $300 and $1,200 per day in direct returns depending upon the size of their truckloads. It's been many years since farmers' markets were a regular feature of life in New York City, but farmers and city residents still have mutual interests. Green Market has shown that the urban farmers' market is still a valuable institution, one which benefits all concerned. So good morning, everyone, and thanks again for coming uh, to the New York City Food Policy for Breakfast Seminar. Um, I'm fortunate enough to live right by Union Square, a stone, throws away, a stone throw away from the green market that's there, which I visit every day that it's open. Um, this year, the New York City Green Market turns 40 years old, and we thought it would be a wonderful idea to have several uh, people who are involved in the market talk about its impact from the past and the future. Um, I would like to welcome the director of the New York City Green Market, Michael Horowitz, uh, as well as the panelists, who Michael will have the pleasure of introducing. Um, welcome, Michael, and congratulations to the Green Market on their 40th year. I promised Michael that I would set up this PowerPoint right away. <laughs> for having us here today. The words that you heard Bob Lewis speak could be said, could have been said last week. Um, it's really amazing how time can stand still and so much has happened in the last 40 years. I'll start with a little bit of background of who Green Market is and what we do, and then we can jump into the next 40 years with our panel and with you. Some New Yorkers, uh, but not most, we find, know that Green Market is part of a, part of a larger nonprofit, Grow NYC, which was founded 46 years ago by Mayor Lindsay and Marion High School in order to provide New Yorkers with the opportunities 
to gain the skills and the opportunities to change their environments and their communities. I am very proud to be part of an organization where our colleagues at our Zero Waste program collected over six million food scraps at our markets over the last four years, where our Grow to Learn program is helping to build a school garden on or near every public school in New York City, offering micro grants and technical assistance to do so, and where over 5,600 youth will visit the farm on Governor's Island that we help build and now operate to learn about their connection to food and community. And all of our work is done in partnership with hundreds of community groups, with schools like Hunter, with the Parks Department, the Department of Sanitation, City Council, the Mayor's Office, the Governor's Office, New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, and the list goes on. And our programs touch millions of New Yorkers' lives every year as we're here to celebrate our 40th season. And this will be the first of many events that we do over this year, and you should check our website regularly. We have some, some great programming planned for the season. We'll be celebrating our birthday on July 16th, and what began with 12 farmers in a parking lot on 59th Street and 2nd Avenue, today operates 54 market locations, over 2,500 individual markets annually, and works with over 204 producers from 250 miles to the north, 120 miles to the south, and 170 miles east and west. So if you're in Poughkeepsie, you're in the center of our world. And despite our incredible successes over the past 40 years, the challenges that led to our creation still exist today. And the need to connect the food dollar directly to farmers is as important as ever. We continue to lose farmland at alarming rates in our region, and we know that too many New Yorkers still lack access to regionally produced foods every day. Most people, when they think about green market, only think about our retail markets. They may not know that we operate the largest food access program in the farmer's market in the country through our healthy exchange program, or that we serve over 6,000 youth annually, offering a 10-part standards-based curriculum developed in partnership with Teachers College to 600 fifth graders in their schools. Our beginning farmer program, formerly the new farmer development program, just graduated its 15th year of new farmers. Of the 11 graduates, nine will be working on a farm this season. In 2015, the team arranged 17 season-long on-farm mentorships and helped start seven new farms, including one on a quarter acre in Warwick that's selling directly to three restaurants. In the last four years of training, over 80% of our graduates have come from traditionally socially disadvantaged communities, and over 60% are women. This statistic is crucial in us in achieving our mission, for we are uniquely positioned to place our graduates into thriving markets, thus supporting these new businesses while ensuring that the diversity of communities in which we are located have access to culturally appropriate foods and can purchase from farmers with shared or common histories. 50% of the farmers that sell at Green Market have been doing so for, for under 12 years, and we truly have an incredible group of young farmers that are going to be our future, like Lori Clevin. For the farmers who have been with us for less than 10 years, we offer a zero interest loan program, loan through Keep a Zip, where we put in the first 30% of any loan up to $10,000. The first four loans that we gave out were funded within five days and with donors from four continents. And that said, 40% of our farmers are going to retire in the next 15 years. And of those, 40% have no identified successor. So to address this, five years ago, we expanded our new farmer development program and created Farm Roots, which offers business and succession planning support and works to bridge our aspiring and retiring farmers. Farm Roots also provides ongoing technical and marketing support for any grower in our program. And we offer a 25-75% cost sharing mechanism for outside <laughs> consultants to support our farmers on their legal and business needs. Farm Roots also helps our grower community navigate the systems in which they interact, from advise, advising on food safety rules, assisting with grant writing and identifying other income opportunities, creating market channel assessments, and in times of crisis, 
such as post storm or crop failure, can identify and secure resources to support those impacted farms. Recognizing that on a good day, 2% of our food comes through direct marketing channels, and that farmers markets are just one of many models to address farmer decline and food access. In 2012, we celebrated the birth of Green Market Co., our wholesale distribution arm. Now housed in a 5,000 square foot warehouse on Casanova Street in Hunts Point, Green Market Co. is the confluence of the wholesale farmers market, our youth market and food box programs, and distributes over 2 million pounds annually throughout the five boroughs, all while paying farmers prices that are mutually set, not ones that are set by commodity traders. Our model furthers the green market mission. We help farms scale for wholesale remain viable by ensuring that all New Yorkers have access to their products. 65% of the food we deliver goes to underserved communities. And as we break up pallets and not cases, Gramercy Tavern gets the exact same food that our Queensbridge House Food Box program does. The establishment of Green Market Co. has allowed our youth market program to expand to 16 sites and our food box program, one of the most affordable options in New York City for food, regardless of local, now operates in 24 locations. Our team worked with the city <coughs> procurement department to discuss innovative ways to structure bids that would allow for more regional products to come into our schools and institutions. <coughs> Excuse me. And Green Market Co. also serves as a capacity builder to other organizations. To date, we've helped 40 other community-based organizations facilitate their own food access and nutrition <coughs> programming, and over the next two years, we'll be training additional organizations to operate their own collaborative buying programs. It is our dream to expand our infrastructural capacity and to break ground on a large regional food hub this season. We've been busy growing our programs over the last 40 years, and yet the focus of Green Market remains and will always be our retail markets. 204 farm businesses rely on those markets for survival, and millions of New Yorkers depend on them weekly to shop for food, meet their neighbors, discover some new ingredient, and to take a break from the monotony of city life. Our markets remain the most dynamic, diverse, and robust places to buy food in New York City. Our 40 years demonstrate that we're no trend, for food's been sold in public spaces for thousands of years, and they are a testament to our farmers that work 20 hour days, six to seven days a week, every week, travel thousands of miles every year, and are willing to brave the outdoors in all weather, year after year. And those farmers are at the market, engaging the communities that sustain them, who are raising their children and grandchildren on those farmers' products. I can't tell you how many times I've stood with Fred Wilklow at Brooklyn Borough Hall and a parent, new parent will come up and introduce him to their child. And meanwhile, Fred has known that parent since they were a two-year-old. Our markets are truly centers of community activity. We want everyone to smell and taste their way through. For community groups to come in and table and let other, their neighbors know what's happening in the neighborhood and how they can get involved. And they create economic opportunities for local businesses, including the local tamale maker who's walking through a setting up on the street corner across the street. We're currently engaged in a two-year study with Cornell University to study the economic and social impacts of downstate markets on the rural communities in which our farmers come from. But our markets are places where farmers can test new products or varieties. This new ugly food trend popping up that we see we call day-to-day -day produce. <laughs> our collective jobs as farmers and staff, is to educate the public on what those varieties are, how to prepare them, how to preserve them, how to make stock from the bones. I was terrified of celeriac until I saw our then market manager, Leela Chapman, doing a cooking, de cooking demo on the corner of 57th Street and 9th Avenue in 2007, and now it's a, a staple in, in my family's diet. I think the perfect example of the power of our markets is the work of the Green Market Regional Grains Project. For years we heard from our farmers and consumers that our baked goods did not showcase regional agriculture and failed to live up to the expectations set by Green Market. So in 2008, 
led by June Russell, we spent the next two years working with our Farmer and Consumer Advisory Committee and our baker community to enact a rule that required all bakers to use 15% local flour in their products. It also required local eggs, sweeteners, fats, flavoring, and incentivized fair trade and other items. Today our bakers collectively average over 50% local grain, but the project has become something much larger. Green Market staff now operates a bi-weekly grain stand where we aggregate products from 19 producers, all who are individually too small to be economically viable at market and operate their own stand. And we play four crucial roles. First, we educate consumer about heritage and rare grain varieties, thus generating a demand for their products. We're then creating the efficiencies for these producers and distributors to access the New York City marketplace, which we actually define as beyond just our own markets. In doing so, we generate crucial income to those grain growers who today can make more money growing an acre of GMO corn than they can growing Heritage Red Fife. That's the economic reality. And in doing this work, we encourage more farmers to plant these varieties on their farms, which leads to healthier soils, increased farm revenue, and more beer and booze for you and me. <laughs> We are not just some marketplace that moves food. We are a mission-driven nonprofit that creates viable spaces to support farms and build community. In the last 10 years, there's been an enormous rise in demand for local products. And we celebrate that and pridefully take some credit for it. But we simply want to ensure that the other and new providers also place the grower and community benefits equally to their own. We've witnessed the rise in Focal, called Bake Local, and we know that some new delivery companies go out of business, leaving their farmers in compromised positions. But it is in all of our collective interests to see the growth of regional agriculture, and Green Market supports any effort that does so responsibly. So in this 40th season, we look forward to the opening of Project Farmhouse, our first ever permanent home where we can enhance our educational programming and offer meeting and training space to other nonprofits engaged in sustainability. We will continue to help develop new farmers, support existing ones, and strive to make our markets better every day. What's amazing is that even after 40 years, we have so much to learn and so much more work to do. On July 16, 1976, I don't think Bob, Lewis, or Barry Benepe had any idea that the Grains Project would, would someday exist. But they believed in a concept and laid an incredible foundation that's allowed for so much good work to happen and to evolve. So en enough of me. I'm joined here today by four incredible partners, friends, and examples of the work in which we're engaged. And each will do a far better job of telling you who they are and what they do than I will. But I will say a few things about each of them. Lori Clevenger has been a colleague for a number of years prior to becoming a Farm Beginnings graduate and a Green Market farmer. And as I always say about her and her coworkers, they class the joint up. <laughs> Zaid Cordia I've known for 15 years when he took a chance on a small farmer's market in Red Hook, Brooklyn, that proved that all communities want the highest quality foods and are willing and capable of buying Evans yogurt milk and yogurt when it's available and accessible to them. Lynn Laughlin is not just an extraordinary chef and educator, she's also a farmer, an organizer, and a New York City food icon. And Peter Hoffman is someone who I didn't even know prior to coming to Green Market, which shows you how little I knew about the restaurant community and his accomplishments. But during my first week on the job, Gabriel Langholz took me to meet Peter at Savoy, and it took about two minutes before I realized how special he was and how much I had to learn. So, Charles, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And thank you for the incredible Green Market team that's, that's sitting out here and does incredible work every day.
amazing. He took away half my questions. <laughs> so if, if you wouldn't mind, um, uh, just just giving a little brief uh, intro of who you are, and I know Michael just did that, but just if you don't mind, sorry. I'm Lynn Laughlin. I'm the chef of Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. We're a 120-year-old settlement house on the Upper East Side with a wide, wide array of social services. We also produce about 400,000 meals a year um, and send them to two senior centers, a homeless shelter at the Park Avenue Armory and a Head Start program on site for 145 kids. Um, we've been involved in the last, I was hired in December of 2011 and told to transition the food to fresher, healthier food and um, more plant-based meals to do it on a budget and to source locally where possible. And that's the endeavor we've been involved in for the past five years. We've gone from about 90% canned and frozen vegetables to close to 90% fresh. And I would say we're sourcing about 40 or 50% of it locally at various times during the year. Um, and that's what we're doing. Our latest endeavor is to start the teaching kitchen at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. We launched it in November, and it's to train other organizations like ourselves who provide food for low-income New Yorkers and people at risk of food insecurity to transition their food service programs to fresher, healthier food incrementally in the same way that we did it. And that's what we're doing at Lenox Hill. Uh, Green Market Co. has been a huge reason that we were able to source our food locally. Obviously, we could not have bought it from individual farmers. And I will also add our vendors could not tell us five years ago where the food, their food was coming from. So they've been a, our biggest important partner. Wow, that's a lot of people to be cooking for. <laughs> um, I'm Peter Hoffman. I currently operate Back 40 West Restaurant on the corner of Prince and Crosby Street where I've been running a restaurant for 25 years. And um, the cornerstone of, the, of our cuisine um, for that entire time has always been um, buying from uh, producers and growers that we know and um, many or most of them being local and that's changed so dramatically as uh, what was, I mean, a lot of that shopping and, and procuring was done in the green markets. Um, and we've seen a tremendous change over those 25 years. Um, what started out as being tomatoes, red peppers, and onions um, with no proteins available um, changed dramatically over that time period so that um, animals, uh, dairy, um, the grain project as well. I mean, all those changes that we've seen it, um, that um, happen together, right? That we're there to support it, um, but then the people, the farmers are um, making the headway and, and taking on new projects as well. Um, so that's been uh, the cornerstone of our cuisine, but we've also sort of um, modeled that to the restaurant community um, locally and nationally that this was um, an important way to build a cuisine and build a reputation um, about how to cook with the best possible ingredients and um, that's what chefs care about at the end of the day and so now um, again when 25 years ago or 30 years ago before I started Savoy I was still shopping at the green market um, you'd see chef here and there once in a while. Um, now um, the best kitchens in, in New York are, are there on a, on a daily basis at the market. <coughs> um, I'm Lori Clevenger. I'm one of the farmers at Rise and Root Farm located in Chester, New York in Orange County. We are a very new farm. We just broke ground in 2015 and are gearing up to start our next season this year, sowing seeds uh, in the greenhouse as we speak. At least Karen is, because I'm here today. <laughs> um, we are an all-woman cooperative farm. We represent people of color, also folks from the LGBTQ community, 
and all of us, there are, there are currently four farmers right now, all of us start, had our start in New York City in urban agriculture, growing in community gardens and urban farms. Uh, I think all of our members were also part of the founding group for Farm School at NYC. And one of the reasons that we wanted to start our farm was to have a rural location where graduates from the farmer or farm in, sorry, farm school NYC could actually come and have that experience as well. Most most of the courses are taught in the city, and in 2015 we were able to bring some of the students out for classes in irrigation and um, extending the season at our farm in Chester, New York. So we were super excited to be able to do that. And I would also just like to add that I have a background in educational technology, used to do web design, still do a little bit of that. Also some organizing, and I continue to do those things. But I made a very distinct choice to go into farming because I wanted to have more people that look like me growing food, taking care of the environment, and you know, just having young folks that could see people who look like them and think about farming as a career opportunity for them. My, my name is Zaid Cardia, and my wife and I and our partner Yusuf Harper, we operate Norwich Meadows Farm. We're a certified organic farm. We started in 1998 in Norwich, New York, not Norwich, Connecticut, or Norwich, England. Uh, we, get, we get emails from England asking us to send them chicken and other things. Um, we started on half an acre. Um, at the age of 36, I had an early onslaught of a uh, mid midlife crisis, and I quit my cushy job at Cornell and decided to become a farmer. Um, we graduated from half an acre in 98, and we currently operate over 100 acres with about seven and a half, eight acres under high tunnels, and we do about 600 different varieties. Uh, it continues to drive me nuts. Um, to give you a perspective on where, we're, where we are now, we serve approximately 1,800 CSA members here in the city, and we do Union Square three days a week, and a couple of the smaller uh, Grow NYC markets, as well as my favorite market where I met Peter, and that is Tompkins Square. We've been there since uh, 2001. And we serve now, this is our fastest growing segment, it's the restaurants. Um, over a hundred restaurants that we can count. Um, it's, that segment has been growing at least about a hundred percent per year. And um, it's very exciting because when the chefs come and talk to me, and there's customers under the tent, and they recognize who they are, and sometimes I don't, as they saw them on TV or something, there's the huge educational opportunity. The growth, our growth, and I think the growth of the green market can be attributed to chefs such as Peter and others who are basically there, and I see people's eyes light up when, uh, when they see the chefs uh, under our tent. Last year we started to also serve um, our customers through Baldor, um, because TJ, the new owner, is a true foodie, and otherwise I try to stay away from the shysters in the wholesale business, but this hopefully will turn out to be a great collaboration as it's still a work in progress. We are certified organic, we've been certified organic since day one, and we will stay that way because we believe in minimizing our impact on earth and not feeding you stuff that's laden with pesticides. Thank you. Thank you, that's all, that's all. Thank you to all the panelists. So my, my first question, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a few specific questions and then actually open it up to some questions for the panelists and you can sort of choose who wants to respond and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So my first question is for Lynn, you're, you're the lucky one. <laughs> so what strategies do you employ to make local food fit into your existing food budget? Um, do you think that other institutions can do the same and what are some of the benefits and challenges? 
we have been able to fit um, local food into our budget. It actually, um, as all of you know from being food shoppers, uh, raw produce is cheaper than processed food. So the more food we have bought in a raw state, whether it was local or not, but in addition, local food from Green Market Co. Food Hub um, is not an addition in cost, it's an addition in labor. So the trick for us, strategy-wise, was to figure out how to, um, how to get our cooks up to speed, staff skill sharing and staff development to go back to scratch cooking with fresh produce as opposed to dumping frozen ingredients into large navy pans full of hot water. So we've done a huge amount of um, staff training. We have done this incrementally so that it happened on a human scale and the staff could keep up with this. We have not added staff. We have taken in interns from high schools, from colleges, from the CUNY Service Corps, um, to people who were either interested in learning to cook fresher food, more vegetarian, plant-based meals, or people who were um, interested it, in it as a profession. So we've taken in interns for finite amounts of time and um, that has helped our staff with the sheer um, workload. I mean, think about it. If you get in um, six cases of broccoli for 500 people or 10 cases of broccoli for 500 people as opposed to a handful of cases of frozen broccoli, it's a much larger delivery. It's much larger to store. It's harder to prep. It requires different kitchen equipment to use for it. It requires more expertise to cook it than a frozen product. And it requires getting people to be receptive to it, which has not always been the case. I mean, we did this on a budget by shrinking our meat portions, and that was not immediately um, a very popular um, uh, thing. So it's been a huge amount, as everyone here kind of talked about, it's a huge amount of consumer education around ecological eating, but not putting this slamming it in people's faces, just doing it incrementally and letting them taste the difference between Green Market Co. Polenta as opposed to Instant Grits, which I can tell you is the same price. So it's not an issue so much normally of price. Obviously, we don't buy Green Market Co.'s honey and eggs. We can't afford that. But we can afford their onions, apples, um, all the New York State storage crops, the carrots, the uh, turnips. So it's, a, it's consumer education, it's staff education, and it's uh, creative menu planning. We are now at about 25% vegetarian meals, which is way cheaper. And we've done that also as a strategy to accommodate for any increases either in labor or food cost. Thank you. So this is for, for a lot of you. Um, what, what can Green Market do to encourage participation from farmers of different backgrounds? And, and um, are there additional partnerships you think Green Market should pursue over the next 40 years? Um. <laughs> My first thought about that is, again, has to do with image. People need to really see themselves as farmers, bankers, lawyers, whatever profession you're talking about. And though recently I've seen more images just in mainstream media of black farmers, let's say, it's not something that you see very common. It's not even very common to see lots of images of women farmers. So the number one thing there is to start, there, there are black farmers out there, there are lots of women farmers out there. Worldwide, women actually make up the larger percentage of people who are growing and providing food to our communities all over the place. So there's no reason why we don't have more images of women other than this stereotype that we kind of have out there that is generally, not to offend anyone, but just speaking truth, white men, older white men at that. And we all, maybe I shouldn't say all, but if you don't know this, that the farming, current farming population is aged averagely in their 50s and 60s, and a lot of folks are starting to move on to retirement, so that's also something that we need to be 
thinking about and planning for in our recruitment processes. And so with Green Markets, I, I first want to shout out, do a shout out for Green Markets and the Farm Roots, or Growing YC, I guess I should say, which is the, the umbrella for everyone. Um, but the Farm Roots program has been amazing for myself, my fellow farmers, as well as a lot of other folks um, of more diverse backgrounds. I think there's been a lot of good work done with outreach. I know I'm also a co-founder of Black Urban Growers, which does the Black Farmers and Urban Gardeners Conference every year. And we, I think in 2012, like helped to do some outreach with Green Markets to let, them, let folks know about the Farm Beginnings course and got a bunch of people both in the New York City course and there was also a partnership course taught with Hawthorne Valley upstate New York, which is the one that I took and was grateful to be able to do that and have a more rural experience, which helped me to really solidify my decision to go into farming. Um, so I'm not sure what the staff looks like at Grow NYC. I'm not sure what percentage of folks um, are non-white, but that's also a place that I always recommend starting, like when you're hiring new folks, what does your outreach strategy look for? Who um, are you contacting to let people know about the position? Because again, it's always nice to have someone, for example, come to my door who looks like me to talk about farming, to talk about whatever it is that that person is trying to get me interested in. Um, so I would say that those are probably the best ways. In terms of partnerships, I know that Soulfire Farm, I'm not sure if you all, Michael, if you've worked with them, but they have an amazing program, an emergence program for um, black and Latino farmers. And so connecting with them, making sure that those folks know about the Farm Roots program, for example, and the opportunities there to learn farm, holistic farm business planning. I'd like to emphasize that because you know, it's, it's not just about knowing how to run a business, but it's about understanding what the mission of your farm is. For example, Rise and Root, we have a very strong social mission, even though we're a for-profit farm, but we want to make our farm available and accessible to people who come from traditionally marginalized communities who are interested in farming, but maybe haven't found the right place for them sometimes. Um, Finding a place to have an internship is really, really important for folks because if you have a bad experience, especially speaking for myself, you know, as a person of color, um, things get said sometimes that people, you know, don't realize are offensive. And that's a pretty common experience for people and people that I've worked with who have kind of been put off of farming because they're afraid of being in that community as a result of that experience. So we want to create a space that feels safe for everyone. We want to create a space where talking about the history of slavery, but also talking about the history of black folks as farm owners, which also exists and isn't talked about, um, is also happening for people. So that they can see themselves in this and not just associate farming with slavery. Because that is, the word small cannot be used in this case, but it is not the only part of history for African Americans in this country in farming. We had entire communities that were based on a farming economy that were thriving. And people need to hear that side of the story as well. And so I would also say that maybe that's part of work that green markets could help do, is for green markets to also understand not just what our history is now in agriculture, but what our history has been, and bring to the surface some of those stories that have been buried, not just for black farmers, but for Native American farmers, for Latino farmers, for Japanese American farmers. Um, there are so many of us out there, so many of those stories that aren't told. Like, again, when people bring up a picture of a farmer, it's usually an older white man in this country. between the two of these uh, questions. <laughs> um, as you can't and don't source all of your products from the green market, what role does it play in your menu choices and how has it evolved over the last 20 years? 
Well, one of the things that I think is so important for um, all the chefs who are making their menu choices is that um, it, there's a couple of things. It's, it, you know, affordability may does enter into it, just the way that Lynn was talking about, that there are things that she can work into her budget <coughs> and can't. Um, but what I always try to do is, is that, um, that there are fresh and local items that are um, the last things that go on the plate. So that, that uh, and that doesn't mean that they're <coughs> garnishes and, and um, minimal. It, it means that, <coughs> that, the, um, that the real essence of the dish um, is um, spoken uh, with some of the ingredients that, that, uh, that, that we get locally and, and that are seasonal. So that, um, that um, and for us, the, the way that cuisine is, is developed and continues to evolve is that we're buying in seasonally, right? It's not just that it's local, but that the menu is ever evolving through the course of the year. And part of what I want to show people is, is that we may live in an urban environment where it's hard to sometimes be in touch with the seasonal change um, and that in this urban environment we can feel like everything is manufactured or manufacturable and extrudable but in fact that we are in the natural world and um, there is the seasonal change and so that I want to express that on the plate so that the farmers market is always speaking that to us. Um, it's always there to say, you know what, um, the green beans are finished. They're, they're not available anymore. Um, I know you can keep buying them and getting them in from who knows where, um, but there's something to remember and express that life is transitional that, um, uh, or transitory and, and that there's something wonderful to cherish in that. Um, so the green market continues to, to, to be that point of inspiration for me as a chef, that, that, um, that a, as a shopper, that if you go to Whole Foods or whatever the supermarket is, is never going to provide. Um, because they're in the business of trying to give you uh, constancy, that, that it's always available, um, and they're dependable because it's always there, whereas the green market is dependable in its um, changing nature. Um, so that's sort of how I use the market and, and, and try to express that uh, in the restaurant. So, so you see it as an advantage to have this tradition, <coughs> constant changing of, of foods available to you as a chef? Well, that's, yes, I mean, it's fundamental to what we do and when, I mean, there are certainly there are restaurants that um, the menu never changes and people like that about it. Um, but we're in the business of um, finding some place that's about um, artistic expression or create creativity expressed in, in, in what you eat and um, along with health and vitality. And um, when you are, when you have a concept that's, that's committed to um, having the same thing on the menu, 365, you can't, you, you can't have that. Um, so yeah, that's fundamental to what we do and, um, and to what we're trying to inspire, whether it's other cooks and chefs who come through our restaurants um, or our colleagues, but it's also um, trying to model that to our diners who then take that back home and um, are inspired to go to the market or cook in that way and, um, and change their lives in, in that manner. Thank you. Zay, this is a question for you. Um, you now rely you know, more and more, not on wholesale channels, but restaurants, right? You said, I think you said you had 100 restaurants that are your customers. Um, how, how important is Green Market, these restaurants, to your farm business? And could you explain how, how it works and how it happened? Okay, well, uh, Green Market is, was the catalyst, okay, for, for the restaurants. I, I, that's, how, that's how I met Peter, for example. I met uh, uh, Michael 
from Gramercy Tavern. That way he used to shop at our stand, but not really buy from the rest for the restaurant. And that has blossomed into selling to all of the Danny Meyer restaurants. So it has been, I mean, they come to green markets for what it is. And then it's up to us to hopefully satisfy their needs. So, um, and by the increase in sales, I would say that hopefully we are re um, reaching their needs. And just to give you an example of something that has uh, brought us even more chef customers, a few years ago, uh, uh, Rene Redzepi and uh, the Royal Prince of Denmark and <coughs> were brought to the green markets and they came to our stand and that has forged a relationship which uh, when you start saying Rene Redzepi in those channels, um, a lot of chefs perk up. So I would say without the green markets, this would have never happened. And it, we, as a business, I'm taking that as far as I possibly can. But without the green markets, it would have never happened. Thank you. So this is a general question for the panelists, and you know, I guess we can jump in, and probably Michael will be the best one. I mean, you sort of talked about this before um, in your presentation, but you know, with the explosion of organic and locally grown food markets, um, the food market, there have been many outlets that have not sort of blossomed uh, to purchase these kinds of foods. How do you see green markets staying relevant <coughs> for the next few years? And, and we'll start with Michael, but we can open it up to other panelists if they want to weigh in. I think you, know, you kind of talked about some of the granular programs that you're involved with, and maybe talking about it in, in this framework would be great. Well, I'll address it in different ways, all right? Firstly, like I said in my talk, on a good day, 2% of food is, comes through direct sales. Everyone that ate food outside. I had a banana this morning. Um, so we, in order for us to support regional agriculture, we need to create the efficiencies to get more local food into existing wholesale channels. And it's, it's fundamental. But we want to make sure that those channels are paying prices that keep farms viable and also to make sure that those foods are going throughout the city. Now those have to be profitable businesses, just like all of these have to be profitable businesses or work within a, a constrained budget. But I think there are ways to be creative to do that. Um, these are some of these are sophisticated businesses and some of the, the new ones that are popping up, I think if they start from a mission perspective can actually be profitable and, and do the right thing. In terms of green market remaining relevant, I think you just heard from Zay that his business, even the expansion of his business is fundamentally dependent upon that retail space at the market. His being able to be there and engaging with, with the chef community, being able to bring and test new products. I think Zay was the first one with ginger at, at, at our market. Um, our markets are, are places where, where farmers can, can try new products, but we're not just a place to buy food, even though of the 13,000 individual varieties that can be found in our market at any time, which you cannot find in, in our store-bought store, store -bought equivalents, uh, it's just a different experience and a different type of place to, to do your shopping. Does anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I, I think a really important aspect for the city um, is that it it's a kind of community, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, the, you use the word community a lot, Michael, and, and Zaid has talked about it as well, um, but there's a, um, a kind of conversation that's going on that um, never happens in a supermarket, and um, whether that's between growers and, and consumers, um, or even just between um, groups of consumers, um, Shoppers and um, and so that it is the town square um, for a broader social and cultural conversation that um, that that no um, bricks and mortar store is ever going to do, um, and that's um, uh, I think it's moved the conversation along. I mean, it, it's sort of hard to identify sometimes, but that um, why it's important to the community and, um, and, and, this, and why this kind of food is important to this community 
is advanced by the fact that there's this town square conversation going on um, four or five days a week. So that's, a, that's really vital as well, that it's this open air, um, um, multi-faceted kind of um, layout. Um, I would just like to add that because of what I do for a living and because of the impact that I see, the relationship that Lennox Hill Neighborhood House has with Green Market Co. and their, uh, as a food hub, um, I, is an enormous amount of trust that I know where the food is coming from. A lot of the startup companies are not probably going to provide the same, th the same kind. There is no other local food hub that I know of. Well, there's one or two, but... Um, we don't use them. Um, <clears throat> there are 250 million institutional meals in New York City a year, and that is not including the school system. So if organizations like mine move towards local food incrementally, it can have an enormous shift in providing jobs in um, strengthening our entire regional food shed. And this is from private and public dollars, so taxpayers should be extremely involved in asking for organizations, their tax dollars, going into regional food. I'm going to add one point I want to make. You talked about the relevance as from a market perspective, not from a farmer perspective. Right? Zaid said he started on a half an acre. Lori is growing on two acres. Is that right? The wholesale business doesn't exist for them. There is no other place that they can get the food dollar than selling directly to consumers. We have farmers in our market that struggle immensely every day. In order to be successful, they have to be great growers. They have to, obviously, like I said, withstand the elements and work 20-hour days. But then they have to be good direct marketers. They have to come to market, set up deal with us as New York City customers. It's not always easy. Um, no display, understand their market business, be good business people. That's hard if you're just doing one individual product, let alone 600 varieties like Zade is doing. We, I was, had a conversation with a caller the other day about what's our responsibility to the consumer versus what's our responsibility to the farmer. And if we have farmers that have maybe what we would, some of us might consider inferior products, do we kick them out of the marketplace? Or does Farm Roots work with them to actually understand how they can be growing that product differently? Maybe there should be a different product that they bring to market that can be more profitable so that we can support those businesses and those farms and make sure that those farms remain in business. That's not what another, what a Baldor or what a, a, a wholesale operator is in business to do. It's to buy low and sell high. And that's okay. That, that model, model works for them. But it certainly is not going to address the aging of our, of our grower community or bring new farmers in, into the fold. So I don't think that anybody has a greater relevance to in, ensure that farmland remains viable than the Green Market Program. That's right. That, this question is something that you and I had talked about before, and I don't know if what the public availability of is, but could you just explain the relationship with the city in terms of how much rent Green Market pays or Grow New York City? Um, and just an example, like a Union Square, how much the, sure. you pay rent there. And I just thought that people should know what the relationship is and how it works. Great. Um, sometimes we go to a community board and there will be opposition that we don't, Green Market doesn't have to pay any rent to the city and it's not fair to the surrounding businesses. We actually pay the Parks Department about $330,000 every year to set up in the 24 locations that we're in. We have a SAPO permit that we pay, I believe, $25 daily in non-parks locations. We pay the Department of Transportation at the White Hall uh, Ferry Plaza. Uh, it's a set number, I think, about $360 a month for the five spaces that we, that we set up there. Um, so we are, not only do we contribute directly financially to the city, but we know that the surrounding businesses greatly benefit on days that our, that our markets are, are in town. Our, we have a market on 175th Street and Broadway in Washington Heights where we've been since 1977. And they are, they are directly set up outside of a supermarket. And that supermarket, when asked by the Department of Transportation, how do you feel about the green market being there? They say, we love it, 
Thursdays are our most are, are our busiest days of the week. If you look at where Whole Foods has set up over the last 10 years, you'll see it's across the street or down the block from, from a green market. So we have incredible uh, benefits financially to the city and to surrounding businesses. Great, thank you. I think the rent has gone up at Union Square um, quite a bit from what it was 25 or 40 years ago. <laughs> right there, I can tell you that's for certain. For certain. Uh, <laughs> So th this question is about SNAP and e EBT. Um, what are your thoughts on the uses of SNAP um, um, and access to local produce uh, to low-income New Yorkers? Um, past experiences, plans of the future, and your own experiences as individuals. It's open to the panel. Whoever wants to take that. Anyone else? Well, we do. No, go ahead. And even though it's it's not a huge portion of our sales, it's a very important one because what it tends to do is connect <coughs> some of these folks with a heritage that they may have forgotten because they've been accustomed to eating out of a can or, or wherever they get their food from. So one of the things that we're seeing is that I am getting repeat now cash customers because you know, they come and buy the heirloom tomato, and then they remember the flavor, and then you've got a customer. And you've introduced them to, hopefully, sometimes we have conversations with them, that the food density of, of the food at the, at the green markets in general, just because of, if you only count freshness, is a lot more than anything that's shipped in from wherever. So I think from that perspective alone, for me, even though it's like, six to ten thousand dollars which is a very minute portion of our revenue it's i'm glad to see those people because then i can talk to them about nutrition and other things and hopefully get them back to eating what they used to eat i also just want to address it from the perspective perspective of this whole concept of food as a commodity instead of a human right for people. I mean, the, the very basic for me is that it gives people who wouldn't have access to healthy, organically grown food, that kind of access. And I want those folks coming to our stand as many as possible, and I'm happy to be able to accept EBT and um, SNAP and WIC at our stand. And I'm also very happy that Green Markets makes that so easy. It's actually part of the farmer's application process. We can apply to be able to do that as we apply to renew um, our, our site at whatever market that we are through Green Markets. And I just think that's extremely important. And it also, you know, there's, there's someone, we're talking about food, we're talking about Green Markets today, but, you know, a lot of the reasons why people can't afford food is because there aren't a lot of great jobs that actually pay living wage, which is also an issue for a lot of our farmers. You know, so here we are with this, you know, we want to be able to price food at a price that makes it profitable for farmers, but we also have to make sure that that food is accessible to our most vulnerable populations. And we have some markets that are about 85% dependent upon the combination of the Farmers Market Nutrition Program, which is both for participants in the WIC program and for seniors, through SNAP and through the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Health Buck program. These are markets that have been operating, like I said, since 1977, since 1980 in the Bronx. Um, and these are, this is crucial revenue streams for upstate growers. And, and there's no question that there's not one New Yorker that doesn't want to feed the himself or herself or their family the healthiest, freshest food available. And food, what's nice is that the District Public Health Office in the South Bronx did a study in 2007 that did price comparisons between the farmer's market and local stores. What they found was that the price differences are negligible. Maybe potatoes here are more, a little bit more expensive and tomatoes here are a little bit less expensive. But their researchers didn't want to go back to some of the stores because it was depressing. There was a lesser quality, lesser diversity in product, and what that demonstrates is there was no better value than actually going and shopping at the farmer's market. Because by the time you threw away half of a bunch of greens that 
you bought for maybe 10 cents less, it just became 30 cents more expensive per bunch. So these, this is, one, it's fundamental that every farmer in our program accepts SNAP and Health Bucks and, and FMMP if, if you are selling at one of our markets. But, you know, Union, you know, even Union Square, we had $275,000 worth of SNAP sales there last year. Throw on an extra 40% in Health Bucks. That is crucial income, and it means that you don't know what, who's using SNAP. You don't know what that, that person looks like across from you. There's no de demographic. And it, it just makes markets more accessible to everybody. Just two seconds on Health Bucks. Just... It's a program that was started by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. It's actually the first uh, SNAP incentive program in, launched in the country in, in 2006. And what we and other market operators have done is that for every $5 spent using SNAP, you get a $2 health buck. So it gives you a 40% boost in, in your buying power and to, to, to stretch your, your, food, your food dollar. Thank you. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask uh, the panelists just for, for one wish that they see the future um, for Green Market really briefly, and then we're going to open it up to audience questions. So we can start with you, Michael. What's the one wish that you could see, you know, the way out there wish? The way out there wish. Huh? <laughs> Aside from <laughs> forever funding without ever having to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Can we come back? Can, we come back? Can I pass the buck? Yes. <laughs> I think along with my wish that the Green Market Co. Food Hub grows and grows and grows, especially to provide organizations like my own. I think Green Market Co. ought to, um, uh, if I'm just envisioning here, I think Green Market Co. ought to uh, think about a retail store because um, New York City's grocery market is uh, getting smaller and smaller every year and we're all somewhere in between Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, and the Park Slope Food Co-op. And there should be something in the middle of that. And I could even see uh, a high school curriculum being involved in uh, running a grocery store. Um, my thoughts are uh, <clears throat> not as specific as that, but that's a, I, I love that one, Lynn. Um, for me, it's this sort of like that, that uh, always we sort of seem to have this upstate downstate um, split in our minds in life in New York City and, and New York State and that um, that we've continued to use the market and really leverage the idea that um, we as urban dwellers and urban diners are um, so intimately connected to upstate and that and that as a as a state as a community as a, uh, in terms of how budget dollars are spent and how governmental policies are thought about that um, we really bring um, the, 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 the two regions together and that, um, and that <coughs> sorry, and that um, Green Market um, is, is able to demonstrate that even more concretely than it, than it does now for um, for the shoppers, for the politicians, um, for the residents of New York State. I think I just want to say something like similar along those same veins. It's just new economic opportunities, not just for like upstate, but also the farmers that exist in our community gardens and urban farms. Like I know Green Markets is doing a project with hot sauce now where some farmers, there's a couple of farms in upstate that are growing starts that are then provided to the community gardens, the community gardens then grow out the peppers and then they make this added value product that gets sold and you know is, is providing economic funding for everybody along that whole stream and I would love to see more projects like that. I just sorry, just this huge vision of like, wouldn't it be awesome, I know that this may not be physically possible, but awesome to have an entire New York State based local economies where, again, like what someone was saying, I think it was Len that was saying, you know, the importance of keeping our dollars in service to our communities. And that, that is something, I used to shop 
at the green markets before, and I remember having a specific moment where I was buying produce from a farmer, and I'd been talking to him about the, the produce, and, and just seeing the money come back to my hand for the change and the produce, and just this, not just intellectual, but felt it in every molecular cell, whatever, in my body. It's like, wow, this is what it should be. I'm supporting this farmer, this farmer is supporting me, and it's this closed loop. And we can just continue to be healthy in that practice. So I would just love to see more projects like that developed. I would love to see the people in this room, even though I'm sure they're already doing it, but multiply their efforts and go out there and get people to shop at farmer's markets. Um, I don't know what the statistics are, but I'll give you for CSAs. I, mean, I have 1,800 CSAs, but that's, an, that's a drop in the bucket compared to the population of New York City, and I'm hazarding to guess the number of people that shop at farmer's markets isn't huge. They still shop uh, elsewhere. So we need you to go out there and convince folks that they need to be eating this for several reasons. Health, I mean, m if health works for me, unfortunately I get a lot of people that come to buy from us because their physician said you need to eat certified organic because you have cancer because of pesticides. I hope that that's not, you know, prevention obviously goes a long way. Um, we need more markets. To sustain the farmers in New York State and elsewhere, we got to have more far far farmers markets. They have slowed nationally. Uh, hopefully they haven't peaked. Um, but we got to get people, people have to learn how to cook. I've been approached by people almost hostily. You, you're making me cook. I got I to gotta learn how to prepare. I mean, and that's, so here's a call for the, for the chefs, and I know they're already doing that. How do, you, how do you take this fennel thing and do something with it? Or, you know, somebody told me, I, I eat them raw, but you can definitely cook with them. Um, so there's a lot of education that's going to have to happen on several fronts. I mean, the rosy picture that I painted, yeah, I, I hobnob with some of the nicest chefs in the world, but we're always on the brink of losing the farm due to labor issues, for example. I could have one, I'm one hurricane away from losing my farm. These issues have to be championed or you're not going to have farms. I'm 52 years old. I don't have anybody that wants to come and do my 20, 20 hours, seven days a week. Okay? I love what I do. That's why I'm doing it. That's the only reason. Monetarily, we're fine, but I could make a lot more money working for somebody else. So please get out there and, and, and spread the word. So, following up on Zayd and Loria, I would, things that I would like to, love to see, I'd love to see us go from 2% on our best day to 4% on our best day. Local food and direct sales make up 4% of what we buy on a, on a daily basis. The one thing that I, that truly, it's not even a difficult thing, I want permanency for our markets. I want permanent locations that, not, that we don't have to every 10 years go back before the Parks Department not know whether or not we're going to be around for another 10 years, or that these farmers will not be around for another 10 years, to have that sense of, of permanency in, in this city, which also means that you don't show up one day and there's a construction job that's, that's there that's been, been displaced by a, a movie set or something that wasn't communicated to you, um, and that it's a, it's a different type of recognition. Thank you, sir. We're going to open up to some audience questions. about access. I'm here because I, um, I live in a community out in Flatbush where um, getting access to fresh, let alone organic anything, is next to impossible. I have to go to five different grocery stores to find anything. I just find the best looking food. And there is no uh, market. I feel like markets are like this huge luxury. I talk about this with my husband all the time. Like such a luxury to be able to go to the green market at Union Square, or to go to 
even a walk up, uh, go over to Cortelio Road to the food co-op, I guess, in Flatbush. That's not, I, we can't walk there. It's like you have to take a bus. So when you were talking about access and people shopping, if I were to jo get, join the CSA in Flatbush, for example, we'd have to go once a week to pick up our share, right? And that's $11 for my husband and I round trip. And that, for 26 weeks, is almost $300 <laughs> to just, and when the share itself is a little bit more than that. So I'm thinking, how could, I mean, and on a $40,000 a year budget, like how does somebody do that? So we just do what we can. And, you know, Target has a couple things that say they're organic and a few other places, but access. So I'm wondering, I guess my big question to uh, whoever wants to answer is, um, what's the big barrier to getting um, farmers markets in, in more places? There, is, there are populations that they don't even know that they're missing out, if that makes sense, let alone the ones like myself who know what I'm missing out on and it's it's just frustrating. So I'm like wondering, what's the big barrier, and what can other people, what can I do as a community member, or to help facilitate creating these fresh markets every and any and all these food deserts out there? Thanks. Can I? Uh, I'm going to hit that from the farmer's perspective for a minute. Uh, as far, I mean, as we're, we're talking a little bit about green markets and farmers markets, but you can try to do a CSA. You host a CSA. That's that's how they start in your neighborhood. That's that's potentially one way of doing it. But the flip side is is um, for a farmer to deliver. That's that's you know we're not really in the transportation business, but. I'm, I'm hiring local people from Brooklyn and other places to do that. So there's your $11 cost, but if you host, that's one solution, or host it close to you. Um, the other problem on the farmer's markets, if, if Michael went and opened up a farmer's market where you are, I don't even know if I have the staff or the ability <coughs> to come. I mean, some of the smaller markets, they need time to, to develop just shortage of people sometimes prevents me as a farmer from doing other markets. And if I take on another market, I need it to be um, sustaining almost immediately because we don't have enough money to sit there for a year hoping that the business is going to happen. So, so that's that's the farmer's perspective. First of all, I'd like to say I'm so excited about what I'm hearing. Um, here in New York. I've been working in food for a long time. California, I just finished a program in Charleston. Lori, what you voice is just like, I, it's just so right on. I have been waiting to hear it. I've been putting it out and hearing it for them. Thank you so much, and Lynn. My vision is every community has schools and every com community, their churches and schools, to have schools open and serving food where people can come home and go into their schools and pick up food, take it home, because that's the reality of what we have out here. And to really, if we could see that kind of system, it could be such a wonderful loop with working with farmers and bringing that food into the cities. And that's the vision, and hopefully one day, and Lynn, the work that you're doing, it sounds like you're like there and kind of, you know, ahead because you're figuring out what it would take to actually do that. So that's the vision, and I honestly think that that is the way forward. Thank you. Any comments? We have a school, and we have had schools in the past host CSAs, and I'm not sure. I think part of it might be the whole liability issue, unfortunately. I don't know how <coughs> for, for me to get involved in that. I've got enough already on my plate, but yes, I mean, and schools have worked well when they were, are able to host. There are many more universities that host. Um, and even there, there's, do you have insurance? Do you, and it, gets, it gets fairly, and you're signing 10-page agreements, you know, so that's, that's a barrier. 
for 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 an individual farmer. You know, so. I just, I'm just sitting here and I'm thinking that this feels to me like more of like to have, starting to have a policy talk with the city of New York and the state of New York and like talking about all of these different barriers and how do we look at them and create opportunities out of them. How do we value our communities? How do we value community health and access to healthy food, value the livelihoods of our farmers and make sure that everyone is eating well. I feel like that's maybe part of where the conversation needs to happen. And then, you know, I come from an urban agriculture background, so one of my first, you know, responses to the young woman up here in the front is, you know, starting a community garden in your neighborhood, if that's possible, if there, I'm, I'm, I would almost venture to say there probably are community gardens in the area, that's one way to do it and you know start growing your own food start even potentially buying from other community gardeners in the area i don't know how many people are familiar with east new york farms but they are essentially a community of backyard farmers who sell their produce at a farmer's market there are also upstate farmers who come and join that market but you know, that's, that's also another thing that you can do, is just get some community folks together and start growing your own food, buying from people who may already be growing food in your community, and then building out a plan from there. But there are already, there, there's, there's talk, you know, about policy and things like that, but the more people we have coming to that table and engaging in the conversation and putting pressure on folks, the more likelihood we are going to start changing things. But a piece of that we need to really start looking at what are all of the barriers we need to map them out and turn them into opportunities thanks so we have time for one more uh, quick question uh, good afternoon everybody uh, my name is Keith Carm with City Harvest Michael how are you um, we partner with Born YC and Green Market on many levels they're a fantastic donor we partner with them on some programming things and they're just a fantastic partner so what I'm going to say I say in love <laughs> but just wanted to amplify uh, what a lot of folks were saying about the affordability. We've already talked about access, but affordability. Even if a family has health bugs, if they have FMNP coupons and everything, you know, $5.99 for a bunch of broccoli is still $5.99 for a bunch of broccoli. So if you can implore to the farmers to at least, if you're in specific communities where you know your clientele is from lower income, obviously they are if they have health bugs. Maybe lower your prices. I mean, sell more and make more versus sell less and make the same. Um, also, we've worked with you on the, the wholesale program, trying to get more local foods into supermarkets. Uh, I'd just say, put more effort into that. and We'll work with you. But yes, we only work in Bed-Stuy, but <clears throat> communities like Brownsville, East New York, Far Rockaway, and I can go on and on and on. Um, where there are lots of supermarkets who could benefit from the wholesale program. I don't know if you talked about it. I got here late. Um, but then one more thing. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, just, um, no, go ahead. Okay, that's it. So I'll address the supermarket. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why we need to have infrastructure in the city that is dedicated to local. Because those supermarkets will not pay anything less than what a tractor trailer can provide them. And unless we have the infrastructure to accommodate those tractor trailers, we'll never be able to get the food into schools, into the public school system, or into the supermarkets that you're talking about. We've done some work in, in Vets Die through connections that you've made for us. We're doing small retail in Brownsville, uh, in, in work that we've done with the, the Brownsville Partnership. Uh, in fact, we now have youth markets there, food box program there and retail programs there. And you're right about your first point. Health Buck, FMMP, SNAP, you name it. You're on a limited budget, you're on a, you're on a limited budget, and it doesn't matter what those supports can do. And we do work with, with our farmers on, on, actually, our farmers who thrive in lower income communities understand the point that you are made, that you make. And we have farmers that do significantly better at Poe Park than they do at Union Square and they, they get volume over, over price. And there's still a lot of education and work that we have to do. Uh, there's, there's no question. And I don't know if I'm well, making a last comment, but yes. the conversations that Lori's talking about, that we're all talking about, 
we're light years ahead today where we were even five years ago. So I have real hope that we are moving in, in, in the right direction, right? The, the slope of justice is long, but what, what the slope of hit, arc of history is, is, <laughs> is just as long, but, um, but I think, like I said, I think we are light years ahead of where we were 20 years ago when I entered into, into this world, and even 10 years ago. So I do have significant hope for the next 40. Thank you. Uh, my, Sorry, I just, food box. Yeah, one more, no, no, one more in answer to, in <laughs> answer to I that. Got, I want to say to the time. So. The, the, um, we, we get donations from City Harvest and we love you and we get all kinds of things. But part of my job is also teaching people or helping people transition to look at a head of broccoli as the main meal. And we're a long way from that, but I think going forward in the next decades, people are going to have to look at vegetables as a costly thing, and that's what they're eating. Because if you're not, if you're adding lentils to that for 79 cents and feeding six people, it's still cheap. It's just that we don't look at that as the meal as Americans. Thank you. So I just want to make a few very quick announcements because I know we're running a little late. Um, the next New York City Food Policy event will be on May 19th with uh, Michelle Nishan um, from Wholesome Wave um, and a few other panelists. I'll look for that. And we're also going to be doing a Hunts Point event um, in June, so you can look for that. Also, next week we're launching our uh, weekly food and policy uh, and practice briefing report, which will be a weekly digest of all the news that's out there and journal articles for that week, uh, nationally and internationally. Um, I want to thank Green Market, um, Liz, who's out there, for and, and Michael for organizing and helping to get this off the ground. Um, to Peter, to Lynn, to Lori, to Zaid, um, for coming and taking time out of your busy schedule. I think it was great, and we're all excited. And I have to say the you know, Green Market has been an influential aspect of my life. And every day that it's closed in Union Square, the three days a week, is an empty day for me. So thank you. <laughs>